we're going to be reading, we're really going to pick up two verses earlier. You'll see that at verse 22. Uh, if you're able, uh, will you stand with me? And then I'm going to ask you when we get to verse 29, I'd like you to read with me, 29, 30, and 31. Okay, I'll read the first part, but when we get to verse 29, join with me there. Hear the word of God. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, for the words that I speak, for the words that we hear, may they be in tune with you. May we speak and, and hear what you want us to. May we know that you are the one and only. You are our Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Paul was a man on the go. He was constantly a man on the move, and he moved quickly. Maybe he couldn't run so fast, but he went from place to place to place. He was always going somewhere. He made a number of missionary journeys and other trips as well. But he had finished his first missionary journey, and after that missionary journey, he's, and after he's put on all these miles and all these stops and preached the gospel in so many different places, he's headed back to Jerusalem. He's got to go back to Jerusalem because he's got to go to a church meeting. A church meeting, always meetings, doesn't matter when you exist, if you're in the church, there's church meetings to go to. Paul had to go to one, and it was an important one. It takes place in, in Acts chapter 15, that he goes to this meeting that is taking place, and what's happening is, has gone beyond their expectations. Paul and some others are, are spreading the good news of Jesus beyond the, the, the circles of the Jewish communities. And there are people who are not Jews who are coming to faith in Christ. And they're saying then, that is the leaders of the church, what are we supposed to do with these people? What do we do with all these people who are coming to faith? And it is the idea of some that these people have to be not only converted to Jesus, but that they have to become like the Jews and they have to keep the entire law of Moses. You read that exactly that in, in Acts chapter 15. And so there's this debate going on. Are these people truly converted or are they only half converted? And do they have to keep the law of Moses before they're truly Christians? Well, they have this big discussion, this big synod, this big meeting, and it was important because it's impacted the church of Jesus Christ ever since. They had this meeting, and James, James who was one who, he, he, he kind of liked the idea of rules. He was kind of well ingrained in that kind of stuff because he had been raised in that. He knew those things. He thought that's the way it should go, but he hears the reports. He hears what's happening, and he says then, James says, uh, he says in, in 
um, chapter 15 at verse 19. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. He hears what God is doing. He says, these people are truly converted. We shouldn't make it difficult for them to think it's hard for them to get into the church. God's already accepted them into the kingdom. The church doors are open to them. We should welcome them in and not make it difficult for them. Paul's excited about that. He's excited that his work has not been in vain. He's excited that he's been able to spread that good news, share it with others. And now, well, he can't let the dust settle under his feet. Uh, He's got ants in his pants. It's time to go again. And so he's ready. And so you read in chapter, um, where, where is it? Chapter uh, 15, at verse uh, 36, he says this. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Well, Paul said that to Barnabas, but it didn't happen quite that way. Barnabas and Paul had a disagreement. Sometimes even spirit-filled believers can have disagreements Barnabas didn't like the plan. He, he said, no, 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 let's. And so he doesn't go. But instead, Paul and Silas head out. And Timothy goes with them. He joins with them. And so they are going and they're spreading this good news. And this is Paul's second missionary journey. They go to a number of different places. And it's at Berea. They get separated. And it shows us in Scripture Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. They stay in Berea. Paul goes on to Athens, and now Paul is in Athens, Athens, Greece, for the first time. And a lot of people journey to Athens. They do. People journey to Athens. To this day, there are a lot of people who visit Athens. They like to go to Greece. It's a trip I've never made, but I would like to go there and see see it. See modern Athens, but also see ancient Athens. Because there's a lot of it you can still see. Uh, We got a few pictures this morning. Uh, That's the Parthenon, the most famous thing. That, That was a temple that was built to Athena who is the god of wisdom, but I don't quite understand this, but she's also considered the god of war. You can go there and still visit the ruins of of that temple built to Athena in Athens. Paul saw that. There are other temples there. Uh, You could go through a list of them. We just picked out another one and put it up there. But there are other temples that you can still see because the Greeks, right, the Greeks believed in a number of different gods, and they built temples to those gods. Um, there's a stadium there. Um, it's, it's a stadium that still to this day holds a lot of people. Athletics has always been big throughout history. People like their, their, their games. And that, that stadium is so big that, that it can hold thousands and thousands of people, like, like 50,000. So it could hold most sporting events. It could not hold the Michigan Wolverines, the national champions, but it could hold a whole lot of people in that place. Um, yeah. And then there's the Areopagus. The Areopagus, that, that word is used in two different ways. It's used for a place. It's the hill of Ares, or it's the hill of, 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 of Mars. That's the Roman way of saying it, the Greek way of saying it. It's the hill of Ares. It was a place. But it was also where the leaders gathered, and the leaders were called the Areopagus as well. And so you can be talking about a group of people, or you can be talking about a place, this hillside, there where they meet and have these heavy discussions. Okay? So there's Greece. You can see why a number of people would like to go there and see what's there, both in history, but even today, right? So a lot of people go to Athens and they're impressed. They see all that stuff. They are impressed. Paul went there and he was distressed. If your Bibles are out, we didn't read this, but if you go back to verse 16 of chapter 17, it says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. Hmm. 
He shows up at that city and he sees that it's full of idols and it says that Paul isn't impressed, but he's distressed. Um, a guy named uh, Clinton Arnold, he's a New Testament scholar, a good one. He writes, the fact of idolatry is nothing new to Paul. He saw it on the streets of Tarshish as a young child. It was present in Damascus, Antioch, and all the cities he planted churches. There is something about the pervasiveness of it in Athens that causes him to grieve deeply. The idolatry here is at another level, and when he sees it, he is distressed. He's distressed. But in his distress, he, he speaks, and he begins talking to the people. He encounters them mainly in two different places. The synagogue, that'd be Jewish synagogue. That's where the Jewish remnant or people from that uh, gathered to worship. But also there were people who were God-fearing Gentiles that would join in worship there too. People who believed in, the, in one God. And so he'd go to the temple or, or to the synagogue to worship And there they would center their worship around the word, the Torah, and they would read the word of God. So when he went there, I've got to believe that the people thought a lot like he did, that they were upset about the idolatry too. Maybe they had lived in, quote, quote, Babylon so long they didn't notice. That happens. Sometimes we live in the midst of all of it so long we don't always see it. But at least I'm sure they would agree with the apostle that this isn't right. But he also went to the marketplace. Don't think of the marketplace as going down to Meyer and, and walking in Meyers and getting some apples and getting some oranges and getting some broccoli and, and picking up those things and then maybe heading across and picking up a pair of shoes and a garden hose. Picture it more like, a, of course, a, you know, a, a marketplace, an open market. But even more than that, picture it more like like a coffee house, and not like a Starbucks, but like where people gather. I remember at the church, first church I served, there, there's a coffee shop in town, and once a week I'd try to drop in there, and I'd go up there and drop in, and you just sit down with whoever's sitting there, and all this talk is going on. Didn't even know a lot of the people, but, but you recognize them, and you sit down and start talking, and yeah, this talk is going on. And as Paul goes in there, there's a whole lot of ideas going on. There's a lot of people who are just proposing all kinds of things, but they're Epicurean people, people who are basically agnostic. There were Stoic people there, people who, who re- relied on themselves to do everything. And there were general people there who were probably trying to figure things out and looking all around them and seeing all these temples to all these gods. And then there's the Aragop, Ar, Arab, I can't say it right now, Arapagus, that group of leaders. Aristocracy. Yeah, that's a different word, Tom. <laughs> Arapagus, the, 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 the leaders, right? And, uh, the intellectuals, and they wanted to talk to Paul. And they come together. And as they come together, Paul talks to them. And when he talks to them, he really does three things. You watch what he does. It's fascinating how he talks to them. The first thing he does is he commends them. Can you believe that? He commends them. If you take a look at what's going on here, it it, it says, um, uh, let's find it there. Verse 22. I got to turn my page. Paul stood up and said to the people, uh, said in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. So he begins talking to them, and he says, I see that you are very religious. Now, some people think there's a negative connotation here, but most scholars think this is a positive thing. Paul is saying to them, I get it, that many of you are religious people. You are seeking after, you are looking for God. In fact, if you look carefully at what he says here, watch how he says this. He says, um, I see that in every way you are very religious, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship. He doesn't say there, even though it says earlier in verse 16 that, that, that he sees all these idols and is distressed. 
He says, I've been walking around your town and I see these objects of worship. The Apostle Paul is, is at the beginning of his talk with them. He, he is commending them. And, and he seems to be not throwing stones at them as he begins to talk. Daryl Bach, he's a, he's a New Testament professor at um, Dallas Theological Seminary, so quite a conservative Baptist-type seminary. He writes this. Another important observation is that despite being aggravated by all the idolatry he sees around him in Athens, Paul manages to share the gospel with a generous but honest spirit. This is an important lesson. Sometimes we Christians are so angry at the state of our society that all that comes through is the anger and not the love we have for our neighbor in need. Even though Paul is so distressed, he finds, um, he finds a reason to commend them. You are religious. You are. And he starts there. And then he finds common ground. If you watch what he talks about after that, it says in verse 24, the Lord who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And it's almost like he's saying, and you know that. You've built all these temples, but you know that God is bigger than the temples. You know that God cannot be contained in a building. If God has any strength, if God has any ability whatsoever, he can't be kept inside a box. And I'm sure that there are people there that think, even though we built all these temples and all these places of worship, they're, they're probably nodding a bit and saying, yeah, we know that God is bigger than this. And if you drop down then, he says something else as well. If you drop down to verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. In other words, what they are saying is some of you Greek thinkers uh, and some of you people have been taught that we are the offspring of God, that we are the children of God. And the Apostle Paul says that's true. Your own poets have said that. Your own teachers have said that. We are God's offspring. That's right. That's right. We are people made in the very image of God. We are made by God and for God. And he says that to them. You've got that right. You don't fully understand it yet, but you've got that right. You are made by God and for God. You are made in his image. Now, I remember the day when people would say, uh, you got to answer these questions. Who am I? and Why am I here? I can remember hearing that a lot. What, who am I and why am I here? And some people phrase it that way to this day. They still say that. All of us have to find the answer to those questions. Why are you here? What's your life all about? But we phrase it a different way these days. We talk about identity. You have to find your true identity. Who are you? And people have identity crisis. And people talk about um, political identity and sexual identity and all those things. They're all secondary. You've got to get to the root of it. You are made by God and for God, and your identity can only be found in God. You write him out of the picture. You're leaving the most important thing about yourself out. Paul says, you got this right. You are made in the image of your creator. And even though that image is distorted, badly marred, you will not find who you are apart from God. You need him in your life. You're made by him and for him. We are his offspring. But then he says one more thing. But we've got to turn to him. You see, even though we are the offspring of God, even though we uh, are his, can we get that one? Uh, even though we are his, even though we are his offspring, we've turned the wrong way. We've turned away from him. And we have to turn back. And he says, the way that we turn back to our creator God is through the one man, verse 31, 
Jesus. We turn back to God through him. And when we turn back to God through him, then we are being restored into the image of our creator. And when we are brought back to God in the image of Jesus, then, well, Paul would say more, but at that point he gets cut off. He gets cut off at that point, and when that happens, when he is cut off, um, they say, hold it. You're, you're talking about something we don't understand at all, and you're talking about this man of God, and you talk about him being raised from the dead, and that's one thing Greeks didn't believe in. Maybe your spirit drifts off, but raised from the dead makes no sense, and they cut him off. But if he could have kept talking, he might have explained it this way. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. That is when you turn to God through Jesus Christ, you're his. You are fully his. We're all children of God in one sense, but you become fully the children of God through faith in Jesus. So in Christ Jesus, you all who turn to God are his children through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And because you are sons of God through the Spirit of God, the Spirit who calls out to God, Abba, Father, you are fully his children through Jesus. That's who you are. And so he's really teaching us two main things. One, your life doesn't come together unless you know that God is Father. Now that's a good thing. I know that there are many people who, who can't wrap their arms around that and stuff. But don't think of this broken and fallen world and all the broken relationships in this world. But he says, your father is, is your heavenly father who cares about you more than you can ever know. You want your life found in him. This is not a distant God, a God who is far away, but it is God who has come near and he wants to be near to you. John Calvin writes about this and he calls him the kindest father that exists. No one compares. Paul says, you guys gather for worship all the time. You go to all these temples and all the, look at all these objects of worship, but you don't know him. He's your father. Turn to him. So you remember that one thing, that, that God is Father. And secondly, we remember that we really, really don't find ourselves apart from him. You're made in his image. And if you're going to really live, you need to be in him. And so he'll tell these people in the long run, he'll tell them, call out to him. Call out to this father. Come to him through Jesus. And he will receive you. He will put you back together. He will give you hope. You will find what you need. I hope all of us have called out to that Jesus and that Jesus invites us again to come to him and to acknowledge that he is Lord. He is the one in whom we have hope. He is the one in whom we have life. He is the one who has come for you. Let's pray together.